Hi, this is John Hind, recovering one of the most unique films ever made. And when I say that, I mean it. It's a film from 1990 by Elias Marriage called Begotten. A spectacular one of a kind, a seductive mystery, a Rorschach test for the adventurous eye. A remarkable achievement which draws together the stories of epic literature, the boundaries of poetry and experimental film, and breaks all molds, furnishing celluloid with new possibilities. Wordlessly recalls the spirit of Samuel Beckett's darkest parables. These visions of suffering give way to equally impassioned images of rebirth. A hallucinatory masterpiece that invades our subconscious and compels us to experience rather than witness. A cinematic force that bears further observation. A metaphysical splatter film. There is no denying marriage's vision or his conviction. Startling, grotesque, and revolutionary. Points of floodlight in those places we choose not to look. Brilliant, unbearable, and unforgettable. An extraordinarily original accomplishment. Makes eraser head seem like Ernest Saves Christmas. A triumph of lyrical grotesquery. You will not forget it. No name. No dialogue. No compromises. No exit. Nobody will get through begotten without being marked. What can I say about begotten that that hasn't already been said by that trailer? What can I say about begotten? Period. It's a it's a hard film to synopsize. It's uh, an almost impenetrable film, and uh, you, while you're watching it, you have the feeling of, why am I watching this? And at the same time, how can I ever stop watching this? It's uh, compelling, distracting, and utterly horrifying, all at the same time, somehow. <laughs> so what can we say about Begotten? What are the concrete facts about Begotten? Okay, Begotten is about 78 minutes, it's black and white, and it contains no dialogue, though it contains audio, it contains sound, it contains some brief music, mostly uh, foley footsteps, sound of, of, uh, of diegetic sounds, outdoor sounds, uh, the sounds of, of um, footsteps, and things like that. 
that's about the only concrete things in, in the world of begotten uh, that we can we can lock down, you know. Uh, and uh, when I say world of begotten, the film does feel like its own kind of interior, its own kind of contained world. It's one of the probably one of the few films that feels like its own really fully truly feels like its own world so begotten and an almost indescribable film uh let's try to tempt fate let's try to describe it begotten begins uh with this rather strange scene it begins first of all with these these lines of uh of poetry these verses and then we're we're just we're thrust into this film. This film is black and white, but it's it just incredibly grainy, gritty. Sometimes you're you're barely able to understand what's going on in the screen. Rorschach test for the adventurous eye. It it really is sometimes. It feels kind of like a Rorschach test in some sense, where you have these abstract patterns and images in black and white that are pulsing in front of you, and then somehow they break into recognizable, definable objects. It begins in this, looks like this house, this enclosure area in the middle of this wooded area, possibly. And inside this enclosure, inside this house, is this figure who appears to be seated. He might not be seated. He's in this garb. He's in this clothing. It, it looks like some kind of uh, costume of some kind, but it may not. Maybe bandages of some kind. And it's this figure who is stabbing himself. He's he's going crazy. He's killing himself. In the credits, we know this character is being defined as God kill, killing himself. And from and so he kills himself from uh, and and it ends and it's rather bloody. We see these kind of this kind of black blood and and spew kind of coming out of him as he's he's uh, you know oscillating and and. Uh, and uh, moving back and forth and gyrating and going, going nuts in this in this corner of this room, and from out underneath him comes this woman who is we are she was uh, credited as Mother Earth, and this this Mother Earth character somehow how to describe it this is a very weird part of the film he she. Um, masturbates this uh parts of this uh of this god and the god uh, it, it, uh, releases some kind of fluid and she begins to rub that on herself and it's it's very difficult it, it seems to indicate that she's rubbing this in the area of her of her pubic mound uh, again this is not uh uh you know sexualized because we're because it takes probably about one and a half to two viewings to even understand what the hell is going on here. <laughs> you know, we see the the gesticulations and the uh, of of this uh, this this pole of this this rod like thing being ejaculated, and we see the fluid. But it's again, it's so grainy and gritty. We don't even really understand half of what's going on. So she rubs it on herself, and then we get into this uh, sequence, this this series of shots where. Uh, specific this one shot where we see her rubbing her stomach, which is uh, large, and again she's pregnant. Uh, and then in the background we see a uh, a coffin, a coffin that that kind of comes into the screen, which uh, appears and then disappears in this kind of uh, kind of George Melies, uh, you know, kind of uh, silent film wizardry of the th- of this thing, kind of you know, uh, you know. Uh, appearing of this of this thing kind of materializing and then kind of dematerializing and and you know this stage it's still more of a kind of conventional black and white experimental film you know with these recognizable tropes these recognizable symbols of of birth and life and death and rebirth and the the idea of you know from a death uh becomes a a rebirth and you know all of this kind of big heavy symbolism it's it's very apparent in this in in this sequence and even the the mother earth her costume seems you know very kind of um you know haphazardly put together she's wearing a, a mask 
uh, so we really can't see what her, what's going on in her eyes, you know. The, the, really, the only eyeball we see in this film is the frenzied eyeball of the, uh, of this, of this god character killing, killing himself. I guess on second uh, thought, I. That's one of the, the the alarming features of this film is is that we can't see these these figures their their eyes. We're not even allowed to have any kind of emotional connection or connection of any kind to these characters that are on the screen because most of their their times their faces are hidden by by shrouds and cloths and certainly we never see anyone's eyes or we're not ever able to make a connection to anyone's eyes. So we never hear we we never see. We never see frowns, we never see sighs, we never see smiles. Most of what we see is this kind of gasping for life, uh, desperation with these characters. With these figures, really. Very soon, we don't, re- we don't really know how we get there. After a few fade-ins and fade-outs, and the sun coming up, and the, the, the moon coming up, and the really, in this film, there are many shots of the the sun and the moon kind of rising and setting and and this 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 sense of time passing but we're we're not really even sure what the sun and what the moon is because there's just dots in the sky after this we see the fully f- the fully grown sun the the she has somehow given birth to this fully formed twitching vibrating son of man who is this uh, this you know this this form this figure the, the something that probably next to the mother earth she, he looks the most human of all these characters in this film but he's covered in dirt he is just on the ground twitching and and vibrating and and just you know going nuts he's not he's just he seems to be most of the time he's just gasping for breath and uh you know like a fish he's just like a fish out of water he's just gasping for breath constantly the uh, the Mother Earth is nowhere to be seen, so he is he is taken by these figures, by what appear to be this kind of nomadic tribe of, of figures, who who kind of figure prominently in this film, and he is towed over some distance, and it, and at this point the film gets into this really sense of boredom where we see these these figures are dragging this guy by some kind of cord or umbilical cord or something they're dragging him over the uh over the this this area this this rubble the film was shot in in kind of these construction areas but we don't we it, it could have well as been filmed in iraq or iran or or a thousand years ago it feels Timeless. It feels motionless. This kind of barren landscape, which they're dragging him over. They they get him to a certain place, and it seems like they they burn him, or something happens to him, where where some somehow he's he's abandoned by these uh, by these people. And I think he, he there's at some point where he vomits these these chunks and these bits of things, and they they have this very uh, uh, significant reaction to that. Then the the mother picks him up, and she begins to drag him, and there's all this imagery of uh, him being dragged again. And then he's, and then the mother and the son are are captured by this other group of nomads, or maybe it's the same group of nomads. And there is this weird uh, scene where they appear to be raping the mother and we're, we're not really sure again what the hell is going on at this point because the, the film is so grainy and and it seems to be in this area where there's a lot of lumber and wood but i i don't know maybe i'm just imagining that i i mean I, again you're so disconnected and these things are so at times hard the, the images are, are sometimes so hard to read that you your mind is kind of lost in in, in this in this flood of, of strange imagery. At the same time, sometimes your mind is just kind of bored and your attention spans are, are, are stressed by the kind of boredom and some of the tedium of some of this imagery as well. But So they, they get rid of her and there's this idea that they dismember her and, and again, they have this weird kind of societal thing that sometimes you're just watching them do this stuff and you're watching these characters kind of move around and what they what appears to be their home or their their kind of tribal area and it almost becomes kind of this ethnographic study of these of these figures of this civilization that 
somehow you feel exists. I mean, it's it's a very weird type of, of, of feel. It's something very weird going on. So that that happens, and then the, then the Son of Man is then, he is then uh, killed again, and they are finally dispensed with, and from their burial place, from their grave, again, flowers and 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 uh, all kind of vegetation begin to grow and in a in a sequence that is uh, rendered using uh, time lapse photography so that is begotten begotten is a kind of feature length creation myth rendered in the form of this black and white silent film and you know, it's 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 quite unique. I don't think I've ever really seen anything like Begotten. Begotten, as I as I've said a few other times, it it has such an interior feel that it it, it it's it's the film kind of to me seems to stand at the intersection of a lot of different ideas and and genres. It it is in some ways you could say it's a horror film. In some ways you could say it's an experimental film because it it really takes the the cinematic form and 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 just pushes it to the edge. I don't think it's a film that really any other film could follow. It's a film which which goes out on its own ledge. It it's totally unique and totally unprecedented. At the same time, there are some narrative aspects of the film. It's not just it's not just completely a Rorschach test. It's not just completely random imagery. It has a progression. It has an A, B, and C. It has the birth of this of this uh, of this figure, of this twitching figure from this uh, God figure and this Mother Earth figure. It has their journey across this barren, you could say, post-apocalyptic landscape. You could even characterize this film if you were stretching it as a some kind of post-apocalyptic film uh, without the, you know, without the without putting it in the context of a post-apocalyptic film and really have having the explanatory dialogue and saying, okay, this is a post-apocalyptic film. You could say it is, but it's got that journey, it's got that progression, you know, and then at the end it's got the death. So it's got A, B, C, so in a very basic sense, it is it is a narrative work, you know. But at the same time, people who are used to um, Forrest Gump and, uh, <laughs> and Mission Impossible uh, might be a little bit disturbed if you were to um, if you were to pop this uh, pop this baby into their DVD player. But at the same time, the film is still a rewarding experience. I think even viewers who aren't are totally familiar or comfortable or have a particular liking towards experimental film somehow kind of attach themselves to this film. This film has kind of, it's uh, gone into the goth and horror scene, and it's become, it's, it's become a, a part of that scene. And you can see many, many YouTube videos with people who have, who have redubbed parts of, uh, of of uh, begotten to to uh, with to music of uh, different types of nine inch nails or or what have you because it it feels kind of like that kind of extended type of music video type feel in some cases and in fact the director Elias Marriage went on to direct a Marilyn Manson video but this film was an early project for him his first feature film it was made. Uh, it took him about three and a half years to do it. It was based on, he was he had a theater company called the Theater of Material. It's credited in Begotten, and the Begotten comes out of the extreme, you know, uh, experimental theater theories of Artaud and theater of cruelty and these kind of very heavy experimental themes and, and ideas which were coming out of, of, of modern theater. And Marriage initially had envisioned this thing as being a, a, a play or some kind of musical or something like that. And he, 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 he realized he could do this far more economically and I think in a far more effective sense doing it as a movie. And he wanted this movie to have its own world. He wanted this movie to look like nothing that had come before it, and the only way that he was able to do that was by 
he shot it in 16 millimeter black and white, and then he actually built his own optical printer. An optical printer is a device, is a photographic device whereby you can actually rephotograph film. And you can do all kinds of effects, you can do all kinds of imposures. An optical printer is kind of like a, a, an archaic film version of, uh, of Photoshop or uh, After Effects, where you can, you can photographically do a lot of extraordinary, you can change the density, you can change the black level, you can, you can zoom in, you can, using different lenses, you can block parts of, this, of, the, of the image out. You can do all of this with an optical printer. And uh, he didn't have the money to, he didn't have the half a million dollars or more that would actually cost to buy an optical printer. So he spent, he spent a long time, let's say, and this, this post-production of this film took about eight and a half months. The film took uh, overall three and a half years to make. He spent a lot of time going to these um optical effects houses and bugging people for old equipment. He actually put together, he built his own optical printer where he painstakingly, one frame at a time, rephotographed this entire film and did all kinds of experimentation from shot to shot, changed the, the density and the and the composition and the and and the and the complexion of each and every frame of this film. So there is a lot of dedication, there is a lot of energy and, and work that you see, you know, a, a kind of painterly perspective that's that's infused in every single frame of Begotten, which you, I think even the most um, unassuming viewer can cannot help but just feel that, can just feel that in, in this in this work. So, you know, you got to give him props for that, okay? Sorry, you got to give him props. <laughs> Along with uh, the experimental theories, the theater of cruelty of our toad, you have... You know, a lot of James Frazier, Golden Bow, these kind of um, Fisher King creation myths, which you, you see throughout the evolution of the story. But there, there is such a distance to the story that it's it's hard to make that out. It's hard to completely understand that. But it's okay that it's maybe impossible to completely understand. I mean, there are parts of this film that you get this very uncomfortable feeling that this film is going on while you're not even watching it. That, it, 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 that the film doesn't even need an audience, that we're just looking into a window, into a world that's, that's somehow continuing without us. And that's, that's, a very, that's a very, very scary feeling, really, when you feel that the, that the audience has just been kind of vaporized in this film, which, in a sense, it really is existing for the audience, it's not existing for the audience. And the film is very creepy to watch it late at night. You know, I would I would barely even watch the the trailer late at night. Um, the audio that I played for you at the beginning of this of this uh, show was the audio from the World Artist um, release of Begotten. The film was released on VHS in the early '90s by World Artist Video, uh, a very small video label. It, there was an article on Begotten. In um, in film threat, the film you know had taken a long time to make. It had gotten you know a, a very low energy, low response, and then went to the San Francisco International Film Festival, and it just began to pick up steam. And critics began to recognize it. And Susan Sontag wrote a, a very glowing review of Begotten, and the film is very much a critic's film, you know, let's be honest about that, it's a, it's a very abstract film, so critics can really pile on the superlatives and really make this whatever they want to make it, you know, you can pretty much even make up your own plot synopsis for the film, you know, in a in hundred ways from Tuesday, you can describe the film in hundreds of different ways, and it still kind of makes sense, you know, so it's a very nice film to write about, because it gives it gives the critic that kind of flexibility and that kind of openness in in writing a review. At the same time, it's it's a so it's a critic's film in that sense. But at the same time, you know, it's still a great film either way. You know, it's not just some critic's film and then but you go into it, it's just complete garbage. It's complete trash. I do not believe that. So 
the film was written about by all these critics and these critics who are quoted in the, the trailer. And, you know, there was an article about it in Begot and uh, Film Threat. And it was released on VHS by World Artist Video with that wonderful trailer, that wonderful, incredible trailer, as I said at the beginning, which has all those quotes. And it's, and it's scary as hell, you know. Uh, that trailer is just... It scares the bejesus out of me. It, it uh, especially when you when you watch it late at night and you're like you you know you've watched a movie and you kind of just pop in this in at the end. Oh, let's just watch this uh, trailer compilation or whatever. And uh, it it just po- hits you at such an unexpected level, you know. And the film itself, if you watch it late at night, it's just one of those films that are hits you on just such an unexpected level. The film is kind of gotten a reputation as, as one of the the most goriest or strangest or craziest. I mean, you see it in a lot of lists in the in the Cannibal Holocaust, Sallow, uh, uh, Trazel Crystal in a Glass Cage, Ilsa, Shield of the SS. It has somehow gotten into that group very tangentially. But the film is totally unlike any of those. It's not a film which was, which was designed... F- to be controversial, it was not a film designed to, I'm not even sure if it was a film designed to provoke, I think it it was meant to provoke in some senses, but the film to me has this totally unique tone in the sense that you feel like a documentary, in some sense it feels like a documentary, that you're seeing this world, you're seeing these, these creepy images, you're seeing these creepy images and you're seeing these creepy sounds kind of unfold, unfurl in front of you, totally without your 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 need for approval. It doesn't need your approval. It's it's it. The film is operating on its own. It's it's operating on autopilot because it's a window into this very strange, scary world. This world where you would not want to be. You know, you might want to be in the world of Ghostbusters. You might want to be in the world of the Matrix, even maybe if you were a Freedom Fire. You might want to be in the world of Forrest Gump or some kind of calming, reassuring film. But you would not want to find yourself within the the insular, strange creation myth world of Begotten. Absolutely not. Now. As I say a few moments ago, the film was released by World Artists on VHS and began began throughout the 90s to, to, to pick up a little bit of steam. I mean, Marriage was pigeonholed as this, this type of director, you know, this kind of a weird experimental director, did a, did a music video for Marilyn Manson, and then went on to direct this wonderful movie, uh, in the late 90s, Shadow of the Vampire. Oh my god, Shadow of the Vampire. Shadow of the Vampire grew out of um, Crispin Glover giving for birthday or for Christmas a VHS copy of Begotten to Nicolas Cage. I'd heard it was actually Patricia Arquette had given him uh, this copy for his birthday. It might have been Crispin Glover or, or Patricia Arquette. Uh, that story's kind of, you know, murky, but... But in any case, Nicolas Cage got a copy of Begotten, and he was like, I gotta work with this guy. They He met with the marriage, and they really struck up a good relationship, and he was able to direct Shadow of the Vampire, which is being produced by Nicolas Cage's production company, the Saturn Production Saturn Pictures. And... You know, it still has a lot of his trickery, a lot of his cinematic trickery is is in Shadow of the Vampire, uh, a, a really great, wonderful film with a wonderful performance uh, by, uh, wonderful performances by uh, uh, Malkovich as F.W. Murnau and Willem Dafoe as the Nosferatu, a, a real Nosferatu, not a, a Nosferatu from the from the films, again, another film which is playing with a cinematic reality, trying to give it life, trying to make it real. Um, Both of these Begotten and Shadow the Vampire somehow have this feeling of 
of being able to imbue cinema film with a kind of reality as a as a making film its own animal its own beast its own running reality its own ecosystem at 24 frames per second you know and and the old the ideas and in in uh, Shadow of the Vampire of cinema as a vampire itself of capturing images and and keeping them and and, and holding them forever uh, that that type of um, symbolic imagery and those themes really populate both Shadow of the Vampire and Begotten. So they're they're films which really go well together. And then he went on later to do Suspect Zero uh, with Ben Kingsley and Carrie Ann Moss, and, you know, which is a very interesting film, which kind of sprung out of a lot of his interest in remote viewing and, and other things. So Begotten, a film which is ripe for a re-release, a, a reappraisal at this point, I think, the film, as I said, was released by World Artist on VHS, and then when Begotten came out, it was re-released on DVD at that point, because DVD had been the, the de facto format at this point when The Shadow of the Vampire was released. And that DVD release is a serviceable release. It's it's pretty obvious when you're watching it that they used a very old, probably three-quarter inch master video master from the VHS release. They just poured it onto DVDs. No new transfer. It's very murky. It's very grainy. But it's 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 murky in a sense of, you know, when you poorly transfer a silent film on DVD. You know, it's that kind of murky feel, you know? So it's you know, it, it it obviously there could be an upgrade. You could you could get a lot more resolution out of it if you if you were to retransfer the from the original uh, sixteen millimeter elements. He shot on sixteen millimeter. He he then rephotographed an optical printer to sixteen millimeter. I think there was some feelings that he should have just gone ahead at that point with the optical printer. He should have blown it up to thirty five, but he didn't do that. There's been some interviews where he's indicated that he's going to blow it up to thirty five, but uh, I don't think I'm not sure of what. Has, has happened to that. So, world artist, bad bad uh, transfer, low res from VHS. There are even at times in the middle of the of Begotten where if you look at it closely, you realize that there are actually some tape damage. There's some tape rolls, but the film is so whacked out and and some of the imagery is just so expressionistic and abstract and and crazy that you know you don't even realize that there's these video like tape rolls going out you know, on a few moments in the film, so, and I, you know, I don't know what, what's going on with that. The The DVD also does include a really great interview uh, with, um, with Marriage, where he talks about creating the optical printer and working on the film, working on the cinematography, he also shot the film, working on the sound, he worked with this uh, really odd, uh, really odd person, Evan Albem, and they created the soundtrack, they 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 had this idea of they wanted footsteps on gravel they wanted footsteps on different types of surfaces which they which they uh recorded through all different seasons very 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 odd very some very strange experimental ideas going on in the soundtrack as well and so that's that's another area which I guess could fill an entirely an entire show unto itself is that the soundtrack of Begotten is so ambient and strange and again so otherworldly. So Begotten, there it is. I I guess I've set my piece on it and I hope the gods approve. <laughs> Begotten, a film which is I guess I think ripe for reappraisal and re-release via Criterion Collection or some other people. Hopefully, hopefully very soon, until we, we slip into the next life in the world of Begotten. So, until then, this is John Arhand. Have a great day.